Alright, today is Wednesday, November 30, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Uh, folks, I got a good one for you tonight. It's good to be back on the set again, and by the set I mean my garage. But anyhow, let's talk about the stock market reaction today. A euphoric, massive pump higher in the aftermath of the Powell speech, which by the way, Jerome did not say anything new, at least not to me, because here's a reminder of what Jerome Powell said last time around. Take a look. Hi, uh, Howard Schneider with uh, with Reuters. <clears throat> look, I, I'm sure there's going to be uh, tons of confusion out there about whether this means you're going to slow in December or not. Uh, would you say that the bias right now is not for another 75 basis point increase? So, um... What I want to do uh, is is put that question of pace in the context of our of our our broader tightening program, if I may, and and hit the, talk about the statement language uh, along the way. So I, I think you can think about our our tightening program as as really addressing three questions. The first of which was and has been how fast to go. The second is uh, how high to raise our policy rate. And the third will be eventually how long to remain at, at, a, at a restrictive level. So in the last FOMC conference, Jerome Powell kind of prepared all of us and massaged market expectations for a 50 basis points hike in December. Yet he was well aware that if he says that flat out, the reaction in financial markets would be euphoric, a massive rally which will lead to loosening of financial conditions, which will also lead to higher inflation expectations, and that defies all of the work that the Fed has been doing. So in balancing all of this out, Jerome Powell reminded all of us that the tightening program has three elements. Number one, the pace of rate hikes. Number two, the level of rate hikes. And number three, how long are they going to hold these rates at the so-called restrictive rate? So you got the pace, you got the level, and then you got the duration. And the pace is just one aspect of this program. In other words, what Jerome Powell said is, if I go from 75 to 50, don't get too excited here, because this is just one element of the tightening program. So today, when Jerome Powell came out and said pretty much what he said before, that yes, we will go to 50 basis points in December, and we're seeing some progress in the battle against inflation, but not enough. This was old news to me. But the market reacted euphorically with a massive rally, impulsive rally, with the Nasdaq alone gained about 4% in the course of the day. Now, we know that the market also expected the 50 basis points in December. Otherwise, it would have been trading down, even before Jerome Powell spoke today. But it was trading higher to begin with. So why did the market explode higher today? It's not because the market is expecting the Fed to go from 75 to 50. That's not it. That was already baked in the cake. What the market is excited about and what the market is sniffing right now, and this is the real danger in this game, what the market reacted to is, okay, Powell and company been talking tough, but now he's coming down from 75 to 50. So it doesn't matter how hawkish he is. Next thing you know, he's going to pause interest rate hikes. And before you know it, he's going to start cutting rates. This is what the market is sniffing right now. And this is the danger of the Fed sending the wrong signal. That they're talking tough, but they're all bark and no bite. Because what will happen is, if the market continues to rally higher on the expectations that the Fed is going to wimp out and pause interest rate hikes very soon, and perhaps cut them very soon, even if that's not true, even if that's not going to happen, so long as the market is sniffing that out and the market convinces itself that this is what the Fed is going to do, we will see an impulsive rally heading into the Fed meeting, which is coming out on December 13th, I believe. And what will happen is inflation expectations will pump higher again, financial conditions will loosen, and next thing you know, the Fed will find itself in a place where it has to retract and do the 75 again instead of 50. That is the danger of the market overreacting to all of this and not understanding what the Fed is doing. And folks, we have a reality check coming out as soon as tomorrow in the PCE inflation report. If that comes out hot, the market will get a reality check on the reaction we got today. We also have the employment report on Friday. But you know what's really interesting to me? is even before Jerome Powell spoke to the Brookings Institution, which is one of those satanic organizations that secretly control your lives, even before that, the market was down, and I was watching CNBC and the reactions by the experts, quote-unquote, was, hey, the Fed is overdoing it. There is a lag. This whole lag theory, which is questionable, by the way, but they've been saying, hey, the Fed is overdoing it. There is a lag. The economy is already heading into a recession. Do they really want to see mass unemployment? Do they really want to see a destruction of the economy? The recession is coming and the Fed is going to make it worse. Yada, 
Yada, yada. And their theory before in buying the market, we're talking about the bulls, of course, is, oh, the Fed has to pause and they have to pivot because if they don't, the economy is going to head into a recession. It's already heading into a recession. But after the rally, and after Jerome Powell spoke, their reaction is, oh, you have to buy the market because the soft landing is a real possibility now. Wait a minute. What happened to the recession part? What happened to the Fed overdoing it? You see the delusion, the confusion by the bulls. They have no idea why the market should rally. They just want to rally either way way. And frankly speaking, I tweeted this even before Jerome Powell spoke. I said, I'm really hoping for Powell to come out today and give the sheep what they want. An end. Forget about a pause. Forget about going from 75 to 50. Just end it already. End interest rate hikes altogether. Because you know what's going to happen next? Inflation is going to skyrocket again, while the economy will continue to weaken either way. And then the Fed will have no other choice but to raise rates again. But at that point, the economy will be a lot weaker. We will see unemployment rising higher either way. And raising rates under these circumstances will crash the economy into a depression. But maybe this is what the fools need to see to be convinced that they're wrong, that there hasn't been an inflation cycle in history that ended without the Fed raising rates above the rate of inflation, that there hasn't been a market bottom in history as the economy was heading into a recession. Do they really want to see that damage to be convinced that the Fed has to be as aggressive as they can right now in tightening the monetary policy to reduce inflation while perhaps the economy can still handle it? But no. All they care about is their portfolios in the stock market, and they want the Fed to step aside and say, okay, we've done enough, and there's this lag that's going to kill inflation either way at some point. And look, I also tweeted this before. The natural evolution of the inflation cycle is inflation that becomes stagflation and stagflation becomes a recession. This has always, always been how inflation worked out. And the power that the Fed has in all of this is limited. They can tighten the monetary policy enough to destroy inflation, but this will lead to the recession part. But the beauty in doing so is they skip the stagflation part. However, if the Fed goes back into cutting rates, for example, we go back to inflation surging significantly higher again. Now, if they slow down the fight against inflation prematurely or pause it, what's going to happen is we're going to see the stagflation part where the pressure against the economy is going to persist, and we see the pace of economic activity slowing down, yet inflation is going to stick at a higher level, and hence we have stagflation. So when folks think about the Fed as this almighty that can change the outcome of things, the simple answer to that is they're not really that powerful. Inflation remains in the driver's seat. Inflation is guiding this conversation. And all what the Fed has is the power to either go backward to the inflation part, play the stagflation part, or fast forward to the recession part. That's all the power they got right now. And of course, external factors will force the Fed's hand to act one way or the other. For example, if this euphoric rally overdo it and it goes bananas before the next FOMC meeting, the Fed will have to come out and reverse to the 75 again instead of 50. And doing so will ensure that the recession part is going to happen sooner than later. And it's going to be more intense than it was before. And look, the same people who say, oh, the Fed is overdoing it and they need to stop, there is a lag, are the same people who did not mind when the Fed overdid it in quantitative easing and created the biggest financial bubble in history because it benefited them, because it made them richer. They're only mad right now and saying the Fed is overdoing the tightening because they're losing money. That's what it's all about. And folks, I can spend the entire episode tonight talking about the Fed and what's going to happen to the outlook of inflation if this happens or if that happens, but we have spent a lot of time in this channel here talking about this ad nauseum, and you guys know my views exactly. If the Fed prematurely pauses or wimps out in the tightening program, inflation will make a comeback, and then they will have to resume the fight again at a worse place than they are right now, and the economy will suffer a major recession. The recession is inevitable. It's going to happen either way. The question is, do you want it sooner and faster, or do you want it come later, but it comes out more intense. These are the choices that the market have right now. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this tonight. I'd rather talk about individual stocks and companies and what's going on with them because we have an important company, perhaps the most important company in the stock market, Apple. And we have a lot of developments for this company. So let's talk about it. And here it is in focus tonight. Get him, Elon Musk versus Apple. And ladies and gentlemen, this story starts all the way back with legendary inventor Steve Jobs. Take a look. We solved this problem, so how are we going to take this to a mobile device? Well, what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. 
a giant screen. Now, how are we going to communicate this? We don't want to carry around a mouse, right? So what are we going to do? Oh, a stylus, right? We're going to use a stylus. No. <laughs> no. Who wants a stylus? You have to get them and put them away and you lose them. Yuck. Nobody wants a stylus. So let's not use a stylus. We're going to use the best pointing device in the world. We're going to use a pointing device that we're all born with. We're born with 10 of them. We're going to use our fingers. It is just amazing to me how exciting Apple was under Steve Jobs. Tim Cook could not even come close. But since the revelation of the iPhone, which was a miracle, the prolification of smartphones took the planet like wildfire. And of course, Apple became the biggest winner in the prolification of smartphones on the planet. Matter of fact, in this country alone, over 200 million iPhones are now active. In other words, the majority of Americans are iPhone users. No other company has reached this kind of success and penetration in the population like Apple did. And of course, with such penetration, with over 200 million Americans using iPhones, Apple has an enormous power. But we knew all along that at some point the growth story in Apple will come to an end because there is a ceiling to how many iPhones you can sell. If you sell an iPhone to the entire country and every single American owns an iPhone, then Apple reached a growth ceiling in the United States. They have full penetration of the market. In other words, stagnation. And you're seeing a lot of companies, specifically in the streaming arena, such as Netflix right now, facing the same problem. When you're a company and you've reached your maximum penetration potential, your growth comes to an end. And the only thing you can do is release new models every year and hope that the majority will upgrade or you can continue to increase prices higher. And you're seeing this in the case of Netflix. And this is a major problem with any growth company. Specifically when it comes to iPhones, you buy it this year, Maybe you're not going to need an upgrade until, I don't know, three, four years from now. And that means that the company is going to stop growing. So as the CEO of the company, how do you resolve this problem? Well, Apple figured out a way, a creative way, to get around it. And they created what is now known as the services revenue. In other words, any transaction that happens on an iPhone, Apple gets a cut worth about 30%. So for example, I have a membership program in this channel where you can, you know, pay me a monthly subscription and that way you can support the channel. But if you're an iPhone user or you're watching from a Mac, for example, you're not going to see this option. And the reason is Google says, hey, Apple, you're not going to get 30% of the revenue. And Apple responds by saying, okay, we're not going to show this to our users at all. If anybody uses an iPhone, they're not going to see this option. But it gets even worse. If you have an application, if you're any company and you do a transaction with an iPhone user, Apple gets 30% of that revenue. And in this channel, we call it the racketeering revenue, where the iMob pretty much bullies every other app out there that every transaction you make with an iPhone user, we're going to get 30% of that revenue. Even though Apple did not work in creating any of that logistics, they have nothing in the creation of that particular service or good that iPhone users are buying from other companies, but they get to charge 30% either way. It's a mobster-like behavior. It's a racketeering operation. This is why we call Apple the iMob, and their services revenue, we call it the rent. The rent. Pay for the rent. The rent. The rent. Because if you don't pay the rent to Apple, God forbid, you might get banned from the store. Uh, they might send somebody to, to break your kneecaps. And this is exactly what they've done. For example, we're all familiar with the battle between Apple and Epic Games, aka Fortnite. Apple said either you give us a share of that revenue or you're out. You can't do transactions with any iPhone user. And they do this with every other application, be it Facebook be it Spotify, be it Pandora, be it anything you use in an iPhone, Apple gets 30% of the revenue. This is a company that cannot innovate anymore. They cannot produce new products, new exciting products, just like they did back in the Steve Jobs era. So their response to increase the growth of the company again is the racketeering revenue. And they have been really, really successful in this revenue. As you can see, the share of revenue for the company, the entire company Apple, the share of iPhones is going down. The share of iPads and Macs going down. But the share of services revenue is expanding. And this single-handedly saved the company Apple. For example, a reminder, the number of active iPhone users in the United States, over 200 million. But the number of subscribers to Apple services 745 million. And by the way, this number is from 2021. The number is a lot larger right now 
I'm going to cover that in a minute, but just to make it clear for you why Apple decided to go with the racketeering revenue to compensate for the lack of growth in iPhone revenue, this is the growth rate in iPhone revenue from 2016 all the way to 2022. And as you can see, in 2016, the growth was minus 12% almost year over year. The growth in iPhone revenues in 2019 was minus 14.5%. They only got a bump in 2021 due to the pandemic and the stimmies, but besides that, the growth in iPhone iPhone revenue has been anemic and negative in some years. When you contrast this with the growth in revenue for the racketeering operation, it's beautiful. It grows year on year by double digits. And the beauty of the services revenue, there is not a lot of input cost. There is a lot of input cost in iPhones to produce these phones. You got to spend a lot of money. But when it comes to, hey, pay me the rent or otherwise you're banned from the store, there's there's no input cost at all. It's a very lean operation. By the way, look at this. Apple services revenue hits $19.8 billion in Q2 of this year. And the paid subscribers, over $800 million. And now Apple wants to expand even more. The racketeering revenue to begin with comes at the cost of entrepreneurship. If you're an entrepreneur right now and you want to create any kind of business, you got to have an app. And the majority of Americans have an iPhone. To reach the majority of Americans, you have to have your app on an iPhone on the store. Unfortunately for you, any transaction you make in that application between you and the consumer, Apple gets a cut worth 30%. The government takes whatever they take. And now you're left with what? On top of that, Apple wants to expand its power even more. They want to become an ecosystem of everything. And now they have, for example, tap to pay, Apple Pay, where you go to the store, you can pay right away from your iPhone, and of course, Apple charges a fee of that transaction. So it's not just transactions between you and other applications, goods and services that you buy using an iPhone, but also in physical stores. And unfortunately, with this kind of monopoly comes a lot of power. And Apple has abused its power to begin with. Any application in the store, meaning any application that iPhone users can interact with, not only they charge 30% of the revenue, but they got to choose whether this application meets their criteria of what they consider as acceptable speech or not. If you have an application, for example, some of your users maybe post offensive stuff or stuff that Apple disagrees with, Apple will accuse your company of lack of content moderation and kick you out of the store. And now you cannot even reach millions of Americans over 200 million Americans. You can no longer reach them because Apple determined that some of your content is not okay, not woke enough, not politically correct enough, and they get to suppress that speech. They get to lecture other applications on how to do content moderation. And what's next now that Apple is controlling payment systems across the country and transactions across the country? If an individual, for example, says something that Apple determines as wrong, are they going to cut you off? from being able to pay and receive money? That's already happening by companies like PayPal. Is Apple about to do that? We know that Apple has banned books from their stores. We know that Apple has censored music in their stores. We know that Apple has banned apps before. We know that Apple censored content creators before from producing their own podcasts on the store only because Apple disagrees with what kind of speech that is. This is a company that is abusing its monopoly power with no clear guidelines, and it is clear that they have too much power, not only in the racketeering revenue, which is illegal, but also now in censoring the freedom of speech in America and determining what kind of content is okay or what kind of content is not okay. And that leads us to Elon Musk and Twitter. Elon Musk took over Twitter because, at least this is what he claims, he wants to restore freedom of speech in Twitter. And he started reinstating accounts that were previously suspended by Twitter. And of course, this angered the advertisers, other companies who say that Twitter is now becoming, I don't know, too much free. People can say whatever they want, like we like it used to be here in this country. And that's not good anymore. And the advertisers are pulling away from Twitter, even though even before, or Elon Musk. There was a lot of bad speech in Twitter. There was a lot of hate, a lot of bullying, a lot of sexual content happening on the open. All of these companies did not mind all of that back then. But now they got a problem that Elon Musk is the leader of the company now. And he's reinstating accounts that they don't like. So they're pulling away and not advertising on Twitter. And we can say, okay, that's their freedom of choice. If they don't like Elon Musk's management, they're free not to advertise. That's totally fine. Even though it's a hit job, we know that. But now we got out of hand with Apple threatening to remove Twitter app from the store entirely. 
In other words, over 200 million iPhone users in this country alone will lose access to Twitter. And why is this all happening? Because Apple accuses Twitter under Elon Musk of having lack of content moderation. And the translation to that, by the way, is Twitter has opinions that we disagree with, opinions that we think are dangerous to our society. I would like to censor that. Would like Twitter to censor that. And if they're not going to do it, we'll do it for them. And Elon Musk says, this is a battle for the future of civilization. If free speech is lost even in America, tyranny is all that lies ahead. And I say amen. Maybe me and Elon are immigrants to this country and we know that the only reason that America has the upper hand over other nations, and you see immigrants with all kind of talents from all over the world, choosing the United States of America over other countries, is because of freedom, and if freedom is gone, there's no point anymore. The United States becomes just another country, no different than any other in the world, where freedom is limited. You're free to do certain things, but not others that powerful people in that particular country disagree with. Elon Musk also adds, Apple has mostly stopped advertising on Twitter. Do they hate freedom of speech in America? Question mark. Lex Friedman says, Apple should support free speech. And I say, Lex, you cannot really bargain with your captor for freedom. The only choice we got right now is to fight back and to point out the hypocrisy of Apple, to expose the monopoly that Apple has over the economy, because the politicians are not going to do any of that for us. The politicians, the majority of them, are in the pockets of Apple. The majority of them either own stock in Apple, or they're getting paid directly by the company. Now we have here and there some politicians, such as DeSantis in Florida. He's taking a stand against Apple. But besides that, not a lot of them. Not a lot of politicians are talking about this because they know they work on the behest of Apple, not the American people. They know that Apple pays their paychecks. And I'm talking about the big paychecks. Forget about the salary that the taxpayer pays. That's nothing. The politicians are selling out to the highest bidder. And us taxpayer, we cannot even get close to the corporations who are spending millions of dollars to support these politicians. But the good news is, now we have another oligarch, unfortunately, we cannot rely on our politicians, our laws, and our system to stop the abuse of power by Apple. So we have to rely on another powerful oligarch, such as Elon Musk, to fight against Apple. And now Elon Musk has declared war against Apple. And he says, if I have to do it, I'll do it. If we have to make a new phone, a new ecosystem, a new operating system that is free, that I'm going to have to do it. And that would be the biggest threat that Apple has ever faced in the history of the company. They sell out to the Chinese government, but that's coming to an end too. They're going to get hit in China, and they know it, no matter how much they sell out to the Chinese government. At some point, when it comes China versus the United States, because of Taiwan, Apple will become a collateral damage. But this... If Elon Musk actually creates a new phone with a new operating system that is free, that would be the biggest threat that Apple has faced ever. And it will indeed crash the stock of this company like you have never seen before. Of course, we know that the media, all of them are sellouts. All of them are paid by Apple, the majority of them at least. And they're attacking Elon. They're saying, at least CNET says, which we know CNET is a sellout for Apple. They say that Elon Musk is weaponizing Twitter against Apple now. Forbes magazine, now accusing... Elon Musk of things that I cannot even read because YouTube will censor this program right now. But these things were happening even before Elon took over. They did not have a problem with that back then, but they have a problem with it right now. And folks, look, anybody that watches this channel on a regular basis knows that I am perhaps the biggest critic of Elon Musk. I called him fraud, I called him a con man, I called him the con father, but I don't see the world as black and white. I'll criticize Elon when he does wrong. For example, today he came out and said, yeah, the Fed should cut interest rates. Wrong. He just wants the Fed to cut interest rates because he knows that his souffle stock Tesla is going to crash. But when Elon says I'm fighting for freedom of speech and he takes the war against Apple when nobody wanted to do that before, nobody wanted to free us from Apple before, I'm fully behind him. And that's that. And folks, let's move on to cover the stock market information that we got today. We begin with the closing of the indices and uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average up by 737.24 points or a gain of 2.18%. The Nasdaq leading the pack with gains of 484.22 points or a gain of 4.41%. The S&P also in the green by 122.48 points or a gain of 3.09%. Now this was, for the most part, an algorithmic reaction to Jerome Powell. The market got what it needed to hear and we saw an algorithmic stampede. But this is also a knee-jerk reaction. Which could do a 180 real easy. 
let's say the PCE inflation report comes out tomorrow and it's not good, we could see a flush down right away. And most importantly, even if you believe in the rally, which sector do you go with? Because here it is, all in the green, but they're led by number one and capturing the gold medal, technology, number two for the silver, communication services, number three for the bronze, cyclicals. In other words, the theme today was expansionary. Yesterday, if you noticed, we did not do a show, but the theme was inflationary. Energy and commodities led the way. Before that, the theme was recessionary, with healthcare, utilities, and defensives leading the way, leading the pack. So again, which theme do you go with? Stick around for the heat map analysis. But before we do that, how about we do the advance to decline ratios in the NYSE 85% advancing versus 13% declining. The Nasdaq 72% advancing versus 25% declining. When it comes to commodities, look at this, the dollar went down in reaction to Jerome Powell and immediately, even before Jerome Powell spoke by the way, we got some news about China reopening and that excites commodities higher. Massive gain for energy commodities, the WTI with gain of almost 3% for the day, Brent with gains of over 4.5% for the day. Peak inflation, you say, right? The moment the Fed eases or relaxes the fight against inflation, the dollar goes down, commodities will shoot up higher again. Simple as that. The gasoline R Bob scored gains of almost 4% for the day. Heating oil with gains of over 3.25%. The loser in energy commodities, the party boy, not partying today, natural gas down about 3.5% for the day. And what's really interesting about oil and exports and all of that. Look at this. When folks say that inflation is a supply problem, we don't have supply. What are you talking about? Look at the exports of oil shooting up to all time highs. And we're taking from domestic inventories to export. I wonder why we're doing this. The answer is because Europe is short on oil supplies. Asia is short in oil supplies. Because of what? Because we told them don't buy Russian oil. They have to get the oil somehow, somewhere. So we, the United States, were exporting our oil to these countries at the expense of the domestic supply. And at some point, domestic inventories have to be replenished. This is a massive tailwind, folks. You have the power, the purchasing power of the government, buying oil barrels at the market price of 80, 85. Soon enough, it's going to be 90. What do you think will happen to oil prices? They will go higher. Back to the futures, when we talk about softs, the gains will led by cotton futures with almost 5% worth of gains today. Lumber also scored decent gains, worth a little over one and a quarter percent. Then we have more modest gains for cocoa, sugar, even coffee managed to rebound today. On the other hand, OJ futures, the loser for the day, down about 2%. When the dollar goes down, you go along metals, and as you can see, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, copper, all scoring massive gains for the day. Silver and copper with gains of over 4% today alone. When we talk about meats, green across the board, and the gains were led by the new big tech lean hogs worth about one and three quarters of a percent when we talk about grains mixed picture here we have a rebound in wheat worth about one and a three quarter percent but soybean meal futures led the pack with gains of a little over two and a half percent the loser on the other hand soybean oil down about a little over one and a half percent and notice that even before Powell spoke there was a little pressure on the dollar because the australian dollar and the kiwi were doing pretty good earlier on. So j Powell was just a double whammy on the action for the dollar today. But mind you, the technicals look good for the dollar, and therefore I say this is a trap. The market rallies because the dollar is down, then something is going to happen. I don't know what it is. Could be the PCE inflation, could be the employment report on Friday that's going to spoil the party. We could see the technicals in the dollar playing out and it shoots higher. Commodities suffer a little bit, but mostly stocks and technology suffer the most. On to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? We see the volume shooting up higher, but it is limited to the two major names. We're talking about Apple, excuse me, the three major names, Apple, Amazon, and Tesla. Besides that, the volume was down across the board, with the exception of Chinese names. You see, nothing happened in China that merits the reaction that we got from Alibaba or Neo or certainly Xping today. These stocks exploded higher, and the reasoning behind this is really peculiar. I wish I could think like these bulls, because they look at the action in China, the protests and all of that, and they say, oh, this is actually good, because it will add pressure on the government to ease um, the thing restrictions. I wish I can think like that. But the real reason behind these moves that we saw in the Chinese stocks today is a gamma squeeze, a stampede in buying call options. And right away, we see these stocks shooting up higher. Now, you're not going to see this reflected in the ratio, the put to call ratio, as you can see right here. But if you look at the dollar amount spent for each trade, you're going to see significant amounts spent on out of the money calls 
today. And this is the reason behind the pump in all of these Chinese stocks. With that being said, the hottest stable by far today was Apple. At around 1.6 million contracts traded today, look at this, once again puts at weighing calls by about 57%. As if the market is saying, at least the options market is saying, we're not buying the pump that we got today. Amazon at number two with around 1.3 million contracts and once again puts at weighing calls by about 58%. Tesla at number three with around 1.3 million contracts once again puts at weighing calls by about 52%. When we talk about the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, somebody's fading the rip in the IWM, the Russell 2000, and they bought the 177 puts for the expiration date, January 20, with expectations that the name could go down and lose more than 5.5% of its value by then. They paid around 3 bucks a piece, standard, this trade, all in all spending around 7.8% million dollars. And then what about the trade for the ticker HZNP? This is for Horizon Therape Therapeutics, excuse me. The name shot up higher on the rumor that some big pharma name is buying this name, be it Eli Lilly, be it Pfizer, be it AbbVie, we have no idea. Somebody floated the rumor, and my hunch is somebody wants to pop uh, or pump the stock intentionally. Either they want to get out at a better price or they hold calls ahead of time. But there was a lot of talk among uh, big pharma analysts who say that this is not going to happen. Eli Lilly is not going to buy it. Pfizer is not going to buy it. Nobody's going to buy it. This is just a rumor. And once we get the confirmation from these companies, once Eli Lilly, for example, comes out and says, hey, we're not buying anything here. This rally is going to frizzle away big time in HZNP. So somebody bought the 85 puts for the expiration date, February 17th, with expectations that HZNP could move down and lose more than 15% of its value by then. They paid around five bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around six million dollars. And then we have the ticker UPST for Upstarts Holding. Somebody sees a pump coming for the name and they bought the 22 and a half calls for the expiration date February 17th with expectations that the name could score gains worth more than 15% by then. And they paid around two and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around one million dollars. And lastly at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker MSFT Microsoft? Somebody sees the rally building on that we got today at least. And they bought the 270 calls for the expiration date January 6th with expectations that the name could add gains worth about 6% or more by then. They paid around 3 bucks and 10 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $1.2 million dollars. On to the heat map, what do we see here? Nothing sticks out, a sea of green across the board. Everything is participating. But the theme today was expansionary, aka soft landing kind of theme. With the big tech names exploding higher, Microsoft with gains of over 6%, Google did the same. We have gains of almost 5% for Apple. We see the travel names, the small caps names, the RKK type of names, chips, cyclicals exploding higher and sure financials got a pump healthcare got a pump defensives got a pump but the theme is clear the market went expansionary today but here's the problem was the action done by human beings or algos if it was done by human beings and money managers we would have seen money coming out of certain sectors into the expansionary sectors for example we could have seen oil down or materials down or healthcare down then we could say, okay, this is a rotation. This is for real. But if anything, this says this could be a knee-jerk reaction. Now we go back to the conversation that we talked about in uh, covering the market performance. Which theme do you buy if you want to buy anything? If we say, okay, Maverick, I know that this is not going to last. But between now and the next FOMC, why not participate in the rally? Which theme do you buy? Do you chase the expansionary theme? Do you chase the soft landing theme of tech, cyclicals, the small caps, the RKK types? Or do you go with the inflationary theme of oil and materials and commodities? Or do you go with the recessionary theme, which is still doing pretty good even today? Healthcare, defensives, utilities. My answer is you go with the consistent ad performers. And the consistent ad performers happen to be from healthcare, defensives, utilities, even from energy. But we have lack of consistency from the big caps. But we also have a lack of consistency from the small cap cyclicals, RKK types. So if I'm going to participate in this rally, I'll buy the big farm my names, the defensives, some utilities maybe, some of the industrials, maybe if the dollar breaks the double bottom formation, maybe I'll go with one of these chip names, Marvell or Texas, or whatever, just to participate in the rally. But it's not going to last. We have talked numerous times in this program on why this rally is not going to last. And it's just a bear market rally. The higher it goes, the bigger the crash. Now, what about the heat map for the ETFs? Again, mostly in the green, but the gains were led by names such as the XLY 
Y, this is cyclicals, and then we have the XLK technology, XBY biotech, high beta. And yes, we have gains for the XLV, big pharma, healthcare, XLP, consumer defensives, XLU utilities, the defensive part of the market, but they're still lagging tech, cyclicals, and the risk on. And you can see this clearly in the contrast between growth and value, both in the green, even decent gain for value. IWD up about 2%, but then he got even bigger gains for the IWF, VUG, all of these growth ETFs skyrocketed today, but also commodities shot up higher. As the dollar goes down, we see gold, the GDX, gold miners shooting up higher, silver, the SLV, that shot up higher too, and then we have the USO, oil, that moved higher. So again, the dollar goes down, Powell comes out, the market perceive it right now, not just dovish, but they perceive the talk of Jerome Powell today as the guy's going to pause, no matter what he says. It's delusional, but this is what the market got today, and we see the algorithmic pump all over the place. Now, let's look at some charts here before we go, and look at this. Uh, did the chart take some Viagra or something? Look at this. Look at that pump. 30 minutes chart, and look at this. This is the magic of algos, and when, when the algos think that Powell actually pivoted and announced the pause, we see a massive pump higher, and now the SPY is looking at 405 as support, and then 410 as resistance. But look at the RSI. It is way overbought. What does that mean? Does that mean that the SPY necessarily goes down tomorrow? The answer is no. But the answer is it is at the risk of doing so for the smallest reasons. And we have a lot of bumps coming tomorrow, be it from the PCE report, be it from the PMIs, be it from any other Fed speakers, doesn't matter. When the RSI gets to these levels, these extreme levels, up or down, in the case of up, the chart becomes risky. It goes down for the silliest reasons. So this is one thing you gotta watch for. So even if you're a bull and you feel that you missed the pop today, you shouldn't. You actually wanna see it down. You wanna see, for example, the core PCE coming out hot. And we see the chart flushing down and then they buy it anyways. They buy the dip anyways. That will indicate bullish behavior and it will indicate that the so-called Santa Rally will be front-loaded all the way to the FOMC meeting. Here's the daily chart for the S&P's continuous contract. Again, above the support, the most important support, 3,960. The RSI, the MACD indicators, are firming up again. But something tells me this was a knee-jerk reaction. And the market will have a hard time building on these gains that we got today. Now, is there anything in the technicals looking at this chart that says, watch out, this is a fake rally? Of course not. But when we look at the SPX, the cash index, a weekly chart for the SPY, again, we have a sloping, descending line of resistance. We're getting closer and closer to this line. This is going to be tough resistance. Not going to be easy to crack above. And that could be gains of what? 1%, another 2%. And then the market has to face this resistance. And it's not going to be able to make it above this line easily. Because making it above this line means the end of the bearish trend. We haven't got enough evidence to justify such a move. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart. Similar story. A pop higher. The pal pop. Or shall we say the algos pop. And now we have 290 as support and 294.33 as resistance. But the chart is overbought. Looking at the RSI from the 30 minutes, even the hourly, doesn't matter. Once again, it means if anything comes out wrong, and I see the PCE, for example, this chart's going to flush down again. But most importantly, we have to look at the Dixie and the 10-year yield, which we're going to do that in a minute. But before we do that, here's the daily chart for the continuous contract, the Qs. It is still above the important support of 11,689, and it never really broke this support support decisively. Now the RSI is reversing some negative divergence, the MACD is re-firming up, but again, if this is a knee-jerk reaction, all of this is not going to matter. As a bear, you want to see a decisive crack below 11,689. As a bull, you want to feel in the clear by the chart recapturing 12,207 as support. When we look at the NDX, the NASDAQ 100, weekly chart, again, a sloping, descending line of resistance. If this rally continues, we have about, let's say, about 3.5% worth of gains, and then the chart will face this very stiff resistance. Here's the IWM, similar story, a pop higher. Now it's becoming overbought, but it did not make it above 188. The only progress for the IWM is recapturing 183 as support. Any problems, anything that spoils the party, with these technical conditions, the chart will go down. But you should not really bet against it right now until we see a reversal and a crack below 183. Because for now, if the bulls look at this and say, you know what, the algos did the heavy lifting today, why not build on these gains until we get the FOMC? Sure, maybe Jerome Powell is going to crack our heads because we overdid the rally. But again, 
it was a rally. It was a big rally. I don't want to miss it. If the bulls start to think like that, we could see the IWM recapturing 188 as support. But the most important chart is this, the Dixie, the dollar index. And again, the double bottom still holds. It's going to have a tough time moving higher from this point on because we have a lot of resistance ahead. But looking at the RSI, it wants to reverse. It wants to crack the negative divergence. Despite today's losses, the MACD, similar story. It wants to cross. It wants to pop higher and produce green impressions in the histogram, indicating bullish momentum, despite today's loss. So I'm not ready to say that today's action is a beginning of something. It could be a knee-jerk reaction. And the dollar is going to tell you that exactly. But a confirmation for the dollar would be gold. Gold popped higher today. But it is still below 1,763. It is still facing tough time to reverse both the RSI and the MACD. Both of them, to begin with, were overbought. In other words, the likelihood is the Dixie is going to reverse, move higher again, and gold is going to move down again. If that is the case, was today's action in the Qs, the Nasdaq, a mere overreaction, a knee-jerk reaction? If that is the case, a lot of people are going to be trapped today. And then what about the weekly chart for Brent Oil? Again, we're watching 85 like a hawk. And I'm not ready to say that oil is dead. Let's short oil because we have a recession theme because we don't have a decisive crack below 85. We don't have a decisive move one way or the other by the MACD indicator. We have a lot of strong tailwinds for oil and move higher. Now remember this, a lot of folks shorted oil ahead of time in anticipation of the recession because of China lockdown, because of whatever reason. But we have covered massive trades against oil, be it for the XLE, be it for the OIH, a single trade alone worth over $50 million. If these people are proven wrong and 85 holds, we see the tailwinds kicking in, we will see a massive short covering rally in oil. And therefore, I remain long oil, but I'm cautious. I have puts, I have protection, and I'm lightening up on my positions, but I'm still long. Here's the 10-year yield again. Could it make it above the resistance and it moved down, but is it a reversal? We know it is weak. We know the MACD is weak in bearish momentum. We see the red impressions in the histogram. We see the RSI in negative divergence. So the momentum is for the downside. The next support would be three and a half. But if we zoom in, we got a clean, nice saucer bottoming formation in the hourly chart. And then all of a sudden, in reaction to Jerome Powell, we see this massive flush down, which could be yet another indicator that this is a mere knee jerk reaction. That's not going to last because the technical pattern was beautiful a saucer bottoming formation and the reversal only happened because of an algorithmic reaction to Jerome Powell. And you will see the same theme with the VIX in a minute but before we do that here's the TLT a daily chart it stopped at the resistance at the gap and it moved down. Is it going to go down all the way to the resistance zone? If that is the case then in all likelihood the rally is going to be over in the TLT at least for now and we will see yields popping higher again. Here's the VIX four hours chart again a beautiful bull flag formation but today it flushed down and reversed all of this beautiful bullish formation. Why? The answer is it was an algorithmic reaction and this suggests that it was a knee-jerk reaction. The formation was set up one way and then we get a massive reversal because of an algorithmic reaction. Usually, not always, but usually this is an indicator of a knee-jerk reaction. We'll see what happens. Here's Apple speaking of knee-jerk reactions. Yesterday we saw somewhat of a saucer bottoming formation and today we got a pop in Apple forming a bull flag pattern. And after Jerome Powell spoke, we see the massive buying program and now it got us all the way to a gap resistance but notice that the chart is severely overbought right now in the 30 in other words any bad news it's gonna flush down again in other words it's a trap okay here's tesla 30 minutes chart we talked about the head and shoulder formation which got us down a little bit and then came a pump today forming a bull flag pattern and the bull flag played out in the aftermath of J-PAL, but again, it is becoming overbought at the risk of pulling down. And we can see a resistance zone, which the chart is already in, but can it go a little higher? The answer is it is possible because if you look at this formation all in all, in the 30 minutes, this looks as a cup and handle formation. So how high can it go? We have to zoom out the daily chart. And what we see here is we have resistance at around 200.82. That would be a gain of about 3% from here. And then the chart is going to become extremely overbought in the 30, the hourly. We will see a pullback. That is, of course, assuming that today's reaction was not a knee-jerk reaction. But we will see a build-up tomorrow. And lastly, Bitcoin, 4 hours chart. What's going on here? Last time we looked at the 4 hours chart, it was forming a bear flag pattern, a mini baby one. But since then, we saw more buying showing up. And now the chart is forming a higher high. We also over the weekend on Sunday looked at the daily chart and I said that this looks like a bull flag pattern and that is now playing out. 
But does it change anything at all? The answer is not really. Bitcoin's chart remain within consolidation zone. And we're not going to feel in the clear until the chart recaptures 18,000 as support. Otherwise, it is heading back to the same destination we've been talking about all along, which is 15,000. And lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? The answer is we have a lot, starting with the initial jobless claims, and then the most important, PCE inflation index, and then we have real disposable income, real consumer spending, and then we have the manufacturing PMI, along with construction spending and motor vehicle sales. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. Take care. Let's get this over with.